great. Hi, everybody. Uh, greetings to those of you who are able to join in person and also virtually. Um, my name is Jen Madriaga. Uh, I'm the senior, senior manager for global community events strategy at Red Hat. Um, and I'm also the chair and co-founder of the Red Hat Asian Network. So um, I'm really grateful to be here with you today to talk about intersectionality um, and the work that I've been doing in the DEI space um, within Red Hat, but actually I've been doing um, work in this space um, since I was an undergrad many, many moons ago. Um, so I just want to start with a story before I, I go into my presentation because I'm reminded why it's important to engage in this type of work, this DEI work. Um, and so I'm going to do a very abbreviated story of what happened to me on the way here um, when I was at the airport. Um, so I was due to fly out very early. My husband um, is also here in Austin, but we were in separate flights. He wasn't supposed to leave until the afternoon. Um, and I'm a Diamond Medallion member with Delta. Uh, I'm on extended status, and so it means that I no longer have lounge access. And so they told me, hey, you can, you know, I got an email saying, hey, you can get lounge access if you apply for this card. So I applied for the card, got approved, had my temporary card, went to the lounge, and they said, we can't let you in because you don't have the physical card. They're like, you need the number, you need the expiration. I said, well, it's actually here in this temporary card. It's got the number completely spelled out, the expiration date, the security code. They're like, no, you need a physical card. And so I, and they asked me to leave. They said, Le you need to leave because you don't have, um, you're not entitled to lounge access. And then, um, and of course my plane was delayed four times and I was hoping to get help for being on standby. Uh, my husband arrived around 12 noon and um, he's, he's basically very waspy looking. He's got dirty blonde hair. He's got very, very blue eyes, about six feet tall. And he met me and I said, you know, I would like to do an experiment. You know, and he applied for the card too because he wanted lounge access and he has zero status. I love him very much, but he doesn't travel. Like I've had diamond medallion status um, for several years running, but I wanted, to, I wanted to run an experiment. So I said, can you go up there and see if you can get lounge access? So he goes upstairs to the lounge and then he texts me and he says, they let me in. And, he, and then he told them, he's like, my wife actually applied for the same card. Can she come in? I'm like, of course she can. So I walk upstairs, and you can imagine the reaction when they saw it was me. <laughs> and if there's any upside of this story, my husband had a better understanding of the daily interactions um, that I have to deal with as a woman and also as a person of color. Like, the amount of microaggression um, that many, many of us encounter is not something that, that other people have to think about, you know, particularly my, my husband. Like he was like, I never ever thought anything like this would ever happen. Um, and so I just wanted to give Delta a shout out because I promised on Twitter that I would talk about the story. So now I'm gonna, <laughs> now I'm gonna go on uh, with my presentation about intersectionality. And so I want to just give a little bit of background um, about what happened in terms of creating this uh, employee resource group, or ERG. Uh, so there was no Red Hat Asian network a few years ago. And in summer 2020, there were five of us that met because of stories that I just told you. We were uh, experiencing a lot of things related um, to all the things happening in the world. And we all found each other independently and said, you know what, we need to create a space um, for each other. And so I want to give a shout out uh, to my founding group. Uh, Robin Chan is my co-chair, uh, Laura Fu, uh, Joe Tsai, and Tesh Patel. And then I also want to recognize Helen Kim, who's our executive sponsor, and she can, um, currently oversees partner marketing at Red Hat. So we officially launched February 17th, 2021. So we've just celebrated our one year anniversary. We um, launched around um, the Lunar New Year very purposefully because we wanted to be tied to something that was significant um, to the Asian community. And now I want to talk a little bit about, um, about Red Hat 
and its Asian population. So we're very different from other tech companies. Uh, first of all, we're not um, based in Silicon Valley or in the West Coast. We have offices in Silicon Valley and the West Coast. But our corporate headquarters are actually located in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is in the heart uh, of the state, if you've, ever, if you've never been there. People always like to call it Raleigh-Durham if they've never been there, but it's actually just Raleigh. And then you've got two other uh, cities, uh, Durham and Chapel Hill, which comprise a, a region called the Triangle, which some of you might, might have heard of at the Research Triangle Park. But because it's based in North Carolina, it's a very, very interesting company, right? It's, um, it's a company um, that has a southern history, right? Uh, and so we actually don't have a very um, high percentage of people of Asian descent um, that are at this company, which is very, very con contrary um, to what you might find in other tech companies. So as I said, there were five of us that met in um, 2020. So we got we to gotta have a space where we can talk about things. Um, and then you know, we also encountered this report uh, from McKinsey. And, you know, and I highlighted it there. It says an employee resource group for Asian American colleagues offers robust mental health support or office events based around the effects of the pandemic. And so just want to talk about the issues that really came in the forefront um, for us. Obviously, COVID-19 um, was a really, really huge deal. And the Asian community was impacted in a really massive way, right? So I, I'm a Filipino descent. And so there are a lot of my relatives are nurses. Um, and so they were hit very, very hard by COVID-19. In fact, I think they make up 20% of the nursing population in California. Um, so there's a very significant personal um, effect related to, uh, to COVID and, um, and my family. And then, of course, we dealt with a rise in anti-Asian violence. Um, and, and this was the part that really motivated the five of us to meet and create um, this group because there was so much secondary trauma coming from the stories that we were witnessing in the media and also it affected um, our elderly. And of course the elderly, um, it's a population, um, you know, it's, they're highly treasured, right? They're, they're, it, it, it just, I don't know how to explain, but it just hits you right in the heart. Like it's a, this very visceral um, reaction to have to think about um, your parents and your grandparents um, being at risk. And honestly, it was like emotionally and mentally exhausting. Um, but because we were in North Carolina, so to be clear, all five founding members were all <laughs> in central North Carolina. Um, there is no way to really explain it in a way as individuals and to show that it was impacting us collectively. And so that's part of the reason why, why I think it's very, very important um, to be able to have um, groups like this, right? So at Red Hat, employee resource groups are actually called communities, and that's because that's a shout out to our open source roots. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a bit about the partnerships that we've done with um, different communities. Um, but I just wanna highlight a couple other things. So another thing that came into play was the bamboo ceiling, about the fact that Asian Americans are the least likely to be promoted within tech. And that was something um, that became very, top of mind for us, and it, we realized it rolled into a continuum of so many different things. Like these things don't happen um, in isolation from each other. So mental health and wellness was such a huge priority um, for us, right? Trying to ensure um, the well-being of folks who are within our community, particularly after incidents like the shootings in Atlanta um, and just also the day-to-day -day of being the only on your team. So maybe some of you can identify with this. Um, being in a room full of people and you're the only one um, of your background. And uh, it can be a very, very lonely place to, to be. And then if you're in a community that's under duress um, and you're also personally experiencing lots of emotion um, from everything that's going on in the world, that exacerbates the feeling of loneliness and isolation and exhaustion and everything else that comes with um, 
being within a, a community that's, that's under duress. So this brings me to the intersectionality part. And one thing that's super cool is that we do have several um, DEI communities besides the Asian network. Um, and so I've got them listed. I'm going to call them out because I think they all deserve to be recognized. Um, so we've got Pride, Native and Indigenous, BUILD, which uh, stands for Blacks United in Leadership and Diversity, uh, Diverse Abilities, Neurodiversity, Women's Le Leadership, Military Veterans, um, and Anitos. So written within our community vision is actually intersectionality. So you see in the second paragraph that we recognize the intersectionality of our members. And not only do we recognize intersectionality, but we wanted to engage in advocacy, not just for ourselves, but in partnership with other groups. Because we realized by partnering together with other groups, it amplified each other's voices. Uh, and also just gave us more credibility because you know, there are numerous people who are interested in having the conversations we were. So how did we start with intersectionality? Um, I mean, honestly, it was just very simple, right? We started um, scheduling monthly cadences with other communities, and not just communities within Red Hat, but also communities that were um, other ERGs that were external to Red Hat which honestly is really, really, I think, important because it helps to benchmark what's going on in your company and other companies. And it's, you know, I guess it's a little bit of a cut, gut check to be able to do that. And then we also provide feedback and advice on community building. So as I said, we were just launched in 2021. So we're a very young community. And so we actually leaned on more established communities, um, build neurodiversity and pride. Um, they reached out to us and they helped us. And they said, hey, here are some of the things you want to think about. Hey, uh, you might want to um, know that this is a possibility. Um, and honestly, it was so gratifying, you know, and also just um, uplifting to be able to have conversations in very frank ways about the challenges um, that each of our communities were having. Um, Diverse Abilities is a newer um, community that came after us. And so we worked with them very closely to launch their community. And there was you know, a really gratifying feeling about also kind of um, being able to mentor and give advice in that way, um, particularly because we were so lucky to be able to receive that from other communities. Um, so you know, we've got lists. We cross-promote each other's programming. And then we also co-create programming. And so I want to talk about the programming um, that we were able to partner with. And some of it, I think, is like super, super cool. And I'm really excited to learn um, to talk about the last effort in particular. So for Asia Pacific American Heritage Month for um, last year, we actually partnered with the, um, the Native Indigenous group um, because people are not aware uh, that within Asia, there is actually a lot of indigenous groups there. Um, and also, we wanted to you know, highlight that the issues that were um, happening to the Native and Indigenous groups, they were focused mostly in North America, but they're wanting to scale globally. Um, and since you know, I'm Filipino, and I'm familiar with Indigenous groups within the Philippines, and I also knew folks who were professors of Indigenous studies. I actually know uh, a few folks. And so I recruited Professor Lillian Mendoza. She's out of Oakland University uh, in Michigan to talk about um, you know, basically the wisdom uh, of the indigenous peoples. And you know, one thing that was really cool about this is, is that she talked about the indigeneity of everyone. Like if you go back far enough, every single group has indigenous roots. And so she talked about uh, this book called Ethno uh, Autobiography, which you can get on Amazon, <laughs> um, to basically kind of explore a new way of framing identity, you know, a, a new way of telling your story um, that isn't about what you do for a living, where do you live, how much money you make. Uh, she talked about something called the long body, um, which is basically a story that, that spans generations. And so it was really cool to be able <laughs> to bring programming like this um, to Red Hat. Uh, and people were just kind of blown away by this. And another great thing is uh, we were able to amplify, you know, our friends and allies within the Native and Indigenous group, because uh, they, you know, they could.
people can now map out, oh, you know what, their story is not just about North America, it's also um, in a global capacity. Uh, and so that was, you know, one of our first efforts to do intersectionality within the context of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month was to also feature other groups in partnership. Um, so as I said before, we were um, in really close collaboration um, with the neurodiversity group. And I am also a part of the neurodiversity group because I have ADHD. <laughs> um, and so you know, I felt very at much at home within um, neurodiversity as well. And so this is just an example um, of one of the um, programs that we featured from the Asian network um, that neurodiversity also helped to amplify. So this is one example, and this one was a particular uh, conversation around coronavirus uh, specifically. Um, and so it was Ju Justine Ongfonte, who actually is of Filipino descent, and she did an amazing job um, in terms of uh, presenting kind of these things that even people within our own community maybe didn't even think about, right? Um, Sometimes when you are in a space where you're learning, <laughs> and I think all of us are continuous learning, and I include myself, um, sometimes when you, you go into a presentation that talks about you know, all these different layers of your identity, it can be um, kind of mind-blowing and actually pretty emotional. Um, and so we also had another uh, workshop that we did with uh, consultant Kay Fabella, um, and she did uh, basically a self-care workshop that was actually just targeted for uh, our community. Uh, it was not open to allies. The previous uh, talk that I showed was open to allies because we did want to have a place where people could have conversations with ha without having to need to feel like they had to explain things to other people. Like I think it's very, very important um, for people to have a space where there's a mutual understanding um, a, a mutual experience um, that sometimes allies, they just, you know, they, you know they're not going to experience that. They're not going to view it uh, in the same way. They're not going to be impacted in the same way, you know, no matter how wonderful they are as an ally. Um, it's super, super important, I think, to create spaces and to talk about things that are particular um, to, our, to our, you know, racial, ethnic experience. So this is the part that I am like super excited um, to talk about, and I'll try to leave some room for Q&A for people that have questions. Um, but it was really, really important for me to do a partnership with Red Hat Build. Um, and why did I want to partner with them, right? So we're, you know, we're actually two of the largest DEI communities um, at Red Hat. Uh, we are both communities that experience violence, very visible violence um, during the pandemic. And our communities, I mean, both of them were in a state um, of trauma, like we were under duress as communities. Um, but also, we wanted to address the complexity that exists between our two communities, right? Um, one thing that we're very committed to within the Asian network is combating anti-blackness. And, you know, and then when we were, ha and I was really frank about it, I was like, I want us to be accountable about those stories. Like, we're not going to deny that that stuff happens. Um, and then the bill leadership, like, well, you know, we, we have anti-Asian sentiment within our community. Um, and so that's not an easy conversation to engage in, right? Because you're like airing out your dirty laundry in a way by admitting those things ex exist, but ignoring it doesn't do anything right. So we wanted to really engage um, with each other in a way that was really purposeful and really meaningful. Um, and so I put the Third World Liberation Front, if you've never heard of it, you should look it up. It was uh, a group out of UC Berkeley during the 60s um, where it was a coalition of different groups that came together and it included you know, Asians and blacks working very purposefully together um, to create change in the world. And so I was like, I love that. I love, <laughs> I love this kind of historical context around it. And so let's, let's, can we model something like that now and show that it can be done, right? And it, we also wanted to feel like we could do something that was really empowering, that could be really uplifting for both our communities. Like it was really important for us to feel like we weren't at the mercy of circumstances in the world. Um, we wanted to 
take the opportunity um, to really create change um, within our communities and also within Red Hat. Um, so what did this entail, right? So um, Rob and I, uh, the, you know, the coach, uh, my co-chair, and then I met with the chair and co-chair of Red Hat Build. We met uh, regularly to try to figure out well, what, what does collaboration look like, right? So it, it actually started with a brainstorm, like, hey, what are ways that we can have conversations, right? Um, and what ended up happening is we uh, ended up getting the help of a consultancy, um, APCO Worldwide. And um, how we got involved was actually, I know the managing director of the DC office from when I was um, an undergraduate. So we'd known each other, and I give my age away, um, for over 30 years. <laughs> and so um, I knew him when he um, had braces, and we were both in the first year dorm together. Um, but we both have been engaged in this work literally since we were like 17, 18 years old. And so I wanted to entrust um, this kind of help to someone I knew. Um, so we see, uh, you know, as a black man, he grew up in, in Boston and now lives in the DC area. Um, we also had to make sure that we could enlist the support of executive leadership, because obviously a consultancy um, costs money. And so what we did is we talked with our executive sponsors and with several other folks to get buy-in. Uh, at the time, we had um, another chief diversity officer. We have a, a new one now that came in in March, uh, but we asked that we be supported in this way. And the project ran from 2020, summer 2020 to spring 21, that included the planning. Um, so what did this consultancy entail? Um, so one part of this consultancy um, entailed intake interviews with members of both communities. Um, so there were about 20 Red Hat associates from Asian Network and Build who the leadership teams identified. Um, so it wasn't just the chairs, it was those of us that had other leadership positions, either as committee chairs um, or they had spearheaded projects within the communities. And we asked, hey, you know, who would be good to talk uh, to this consultancy about their experiences? Um, and then we felt like it was also really important to um, have allies in this conversation because we did want to provide um, you know, more layers to these interviews that were being conducted. And so the questions that were asked were basically around uh, the sentiment about DEI, so very general questions. Uh, we asked specifically about intersectionality, and then we asked also specifically about um, people's workplace experiences. And then the second part of the consultancy actually involved three moderated sessions, and I just popped up um, the titles of the three sessions that we did. So one of the things that we talked about, uh, the co-chairs of Asian Network and Build, was that we wanted to also kind of frame this in a much larger context. And so we started off uh, with a session that was more general in scope about what was going on um, within the corporate world and then more specifically within the tech industry. Um, I will say that I think it was maybe honestly a little bit too broad because you were like, you know, we want to talk about Red Hat, which I think was fair. And so we, we tweaked it for the second session. Um, we talked about Red Hat and we also did small group breakout sessions for this. Um, so people from both communities, from Asian Network and Build, were there, but we also had other communities there. We had folks from Pride and Neurodiversity, Diverse Abilities, Women's Leadership, uh, Unidos. Um, they were there too. And so it ended up being really amazing because it wasn't just Asian Network and Build. It was like all these other communities that were super like, wow, we love that you're modeling this. Let's get engaged. And so they were involved in the small um, breakout sessions, which we didn't record. Uh, there were note takers, but we didn't record anything because we didn't want people to feel unsafe about sharing their truth. Uh, and then we had a third session that was much smaller in scope where we identified uh, people. A lot of them were from um, the, the intake interviews that were done earlier. Um, and we did a, a working session uh, where we identified different themes that we really wanted to talk to and um, you know, basically brainstorm like a list of things that maybe we could see happen. Um, and that was a really um, great experience too because um, you know, they felt like there had never been a space like that. 
for them to ever talk about those things. Um, and you know, it's funny, you don't realize what you don't have until you realize what you don't have, right? Uh, and so it was a great experience, right? It was what was hard about, right, it was the first time we had done anything like this. You know, so there was a findings report that was um, given to us by APCO. Um, but it wasn't even the findings, which weren't surprising. I think they're consistent with a lot of other companies. Um, but it was really actually the relationship building that happened between our communities, because we got to know each other on a very personal level. And then we also got to know the leaders of other DEI communities um, uh, in different ways. And then they were also just really you know, excited about possibilities that could happen next, right? Um, and so that was one thing also that I think is super important, um, is to feel like you can inspire other groups. You know, you can, and, you know, you can be of service not just to your respected DEI community, but to everyone. And I think, you know, that's a super, super important thing to do, is that if you engage in work like this, if you seek to amplify each other's voices and to shed light on um, issues, um, particularly issues that you may share in common across communities, uh, that it can make a really, really huge difference. And of course, this provided groundwork and additional support for further DEI efforts, because now we could say, hey, here are some of the things that we've done. Here are the things that were really, really successful. Here are some things that maybe need to be tweaked um, next time around. But it was really, really great to have that kind of information and to go through that process together um, over several months. So one of the things I think is really important um, to remember um, is obviously people are intersectional beings, right? So um, like I said, you know, I'm really uh, also engaged with the neurodiversity community. So you know, I'm a woman of Filipino descent who has ADHD, who has a son that has ADHD, so I'm you know, a parent of someone neurodiverse. Um, um, you realize that people's identities aren't, aren't just one thing. You know, there are many things. And you know, one, one thing that was really striking to me is that you may be a member of several communities, but you may feel more affinity for one and less for another. But if you create a space you know, like the Asian Network or Build, is that that creates a space for people to do additional exploration, maybe around an identity that they hadn't thought about exploring before. Uh, and one interesting thing that came about when we did the Asian Network was we had quite a few Asian adoptees um, who approached us and said, you know what, I've never thought about the Asian identity and now I feel like I have a space where I can ask questions about it, to have curiosity. You know, um, I had white parents, I had white siblings, I was the only Asian uh, in my family, in my community, and I was never allowed to really talk about it in a way that felt like um, safe. And so that to me was like super meaningful um, that we actually created a space uh, for people who didn't even know they wanted to explore their identity. And to see um, groups of people engaged in conversation about what it meant to be Asian, what, what does it mean um, to be, you know, particularly Asian American, because we have a North, ours is the North American chapter. Um, it was a really powerful and honestly a very emotional experience for a lot of our members. Um, and I think that's super important for people to be able to have that. You know, people may ask, you know, why would we want to have this within the workplace, you know? Um, obviously the pandemic really changed things. I, I have actually um, always worked remote the entire time I worked at Red Hat. Um, but working remote was new for a lot of people, right? And so the things that are happening in the world, the things that were happening at home, I mean, honestly, they were kind of showcased in their full glory um, during the pandemic. And you realized that the line between work and home and your experience just out and about in the world were all really tied together. You know, and I, that seems so obvious right now. You're, you kind of find yourself thinking, how come that wasn't obvious before? Um, because I think we were able to, to stay busy, 
and not have to think about these things. And I don't think it's a mistake that the Asian network was created during the pandemic when things really slowed down, um, when we had time to reflect on things. And reflection sometimes um, involves thinking about painful things and not just about thinking about painful things, but having to process them. Um, and so I am actually really grateful in some ways for the pandemic, because I first of all, I met a phenomenal group of people um, in the founding group and then in the community that we eventually built. And then I ended up having phenomenal relationships and friendships um, with people across the DEI space. Um, and there were a few folks that I'd worked with for years and they were just colleagues, right? And actually, this applies to my co-chair, Robin. We, like, we'd known each other for years. Um, and then once we started Asian Network um, together, you know, I found out that you know, she was a Japanese-American uh, who had families that were interned during World War II. And then it was so important for her um, to know that that story existed for her. And I, I would have never known that if we didn't have this group to talk about those things. And so, you know, and we laugh, because it's like, we never talked about these things um, to each other. And now that we've given permission um, to ourselves to do that, like our working relationship is so much richer. You know, it's not just a personal relationship, but our, our working relationship in the workplace is so much more meaningful. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, a company is composed of human beings. And I think it's super, super important um, to remember uh, the human story, you know. Um, like I said, I feel like I'm saying the obvious, but for whatever reason, it hasn't been obvious. Um, I just got an article in my inbox um, a few days ago about the fact that we need to stop framing DEI as a business case. And I absolutely agree with that, you know, because people who hear that, particularly uh, folks from the younger generation, they know how to sniff out insincerity and inauthenticity. Because basically, when you say DEI is um, a business case, it's basically featuring human beings as commodities and resources and not as people. So I'm going to end with that, because I want to leave some um, time for questions. But thank you so much for allowing me to share um, my experiences and my story with you today. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, yeah. and actually, I'll hold on one second. I think we're going to have a mic because we, we have our virtual attendees. So, yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, one question I'm curious about is uh, to what extent uh, did, uh, did these, these different groups, um, to what extent did you collaborate or talk with other DEI groups and other companies or kind of? Yeah, so the, we have like a kind of a, a quarterly cadence um, with other groups. And I will say that it was facilitated um, by someone we, we knew um, through the National Association of Asian American Professionals because we knew the president of the North Carolina chapter. And so she um, actually facilitated those meetings. But what ended up happening is once you start meeting people from other companies, is that other people who want to start their own ERGs will start reaching out to you independently. Uh, or they'll reach out to someone within the company. So I had a bunch of folks that reached out to people that they knew at Red Hat. And they said, hey, we heard that you have this ERG. Can you connect me with them? And so there really is kind of a domino effect where you can actually you know, collaborate and network outside of other companies. So we didn't really meet all that often. Um, but once you put that story out there uh, external to the company, um, it's kind of amazing how that, um, that, that creates uh, a lot of synchronicity and collaboration um, all of a sudden. Like it felt like it was like mushrooms that popped overnight in a forest. Like it was not something planned. But all of a sudden here there, here there was all these conversations happening um, that were really exciting. Jen. Hey, how are you doing, Mike? I'm very well, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you mentioned the North American chapter. Um, if you'd had any uh, similar experiences 
with chapters in, in Europe particularly and whether things felt different, or even in Asia. Um, yeah. And, and if you had anything you could share with us about that, please. Yeah, so we actually don't have any chapters in Europe or in Asia, we, but we do have members um, that are with, within EMEA and APAC. And so we're actually in close conversation um, with a lot of those folks, right? That we actually have a member actually in the UK um, that approached us. He actually came in as an intern and um, was trying to get uh, a permanent role at Red Hat. And he was really, really super passionate about um, anti-Asian violence. Um, and so there was definitely a theme about harassment that seemed to be you know, everywhere. Like even some of our APAC colleagues are talking um, about you know, things that happen between different countries. Um, but the only thing about that is because the leadership um, group is within North America, we can only really speak to specificity to things that are happening in North America. Um, ideally, we would have leaders within uh, in region that could explore that well. Um, like we've got a lot of South Asian members within Asian Network, and they've got a, a different set of stories related to their community. And so, you know, we've got Tesh Patel in our leadership community who can speak to that experience here in the U.S. And he's actually originally from the U.K. Um, so that was really nice to have that intersectionality um, at work. But we also have offices within India, and we don't. I don't think we serve um, those folks as well, but they're just happy to have a space where they can hang out um, in a G chat. And they come to me all the time. They're like, hey, thanks for creating this space. It's so much fun to meet other people. And so you can't underestimate like the social aspect of it, how meaningful that is for people just to meet each other. Um, we recently had meetups at the different offices. We were able to fund that through Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And the amount of excitement that generated, I think, first of all, because it was the first time people had been back to the office um, in a while. But also, it was like, I get to meet people that I never knew existed. And they want to meet me, and I want to meet them. right? Um, so that seems to be pretty universal globally, to be honest, is the, the need to connect and share stories and to say, hey, you know, I love knowing that I'm part of this like, larger community, this larger um, story. I think that's super important. Any other questions? We've got like, I think, three minutes left. So I can answer one last question. It looks like I've got one last question here. Can you um, take the mic and then I guess we'll wrap up. Um, hey, great. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you for sharing. Um, how much involvement do your like people team or HR have in these user groups? I know you talked about the difference between communities and allies, but is it is there like a Red Hat corporate presence? I guess involved. Yeah, there is. So we have a center of excellence rated um, to DEI that was created. Um, it does map to to people team, which is what we say. Uh, Red Hat to HR. And so we have a new uh, Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer. Um, and I think she rolls actually into our Chief People Officer. Um, so yeah, they're very, very much engaged. Um, so our new Chief um, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer just started in March. Um, and I'll say that Red Hat's very, very young in DEI efforts. And so we're still kind of figuring things out um, from like a structural way or policy way to implement. Like right now, I would characterize a lot of our efforts as being kind of ad hoc. I mean, there were a couple other consultancies that were happening uh, simultaneously with ours. Um, but right now, it's just about kind of getting that data together and trying to figure out what's the best path forward um, from an HR perspective. So that's very much still in the works. But yes, we, we are partnered with them. And I think I'm about at time. So I just want to thank um, all of you for coming, and I want to ask people to keep in touch. Here's my email. Uh, I'm on Twitter, and then also uh, find me on LinkedIn. And then I will be at the Red Hat booth afterwards if you want to have a conversation. Uh, I'd be glad to meet with you. So thank you so much.